experienced designers combine story and ritual as tools to create meaningful moments that bond an individual to a community. To better understand how, why, and to what extent should ritual be applied to experiential design, I interviewed Casper Takile, the author of The Power of Ritual, Turning Everyday Activities into Soulful Practices, and the co-founder of Sacred Design Lab. Hi, um, well, could you first tell us, like, sort of, um, tell us who you are and a, a bit about Sacred Design and how it came to be? Sure, so I'm Casper Terkyle. Uh, I'm the author of The Power of Ritual and one of the co-founders of Sacred Design Lab. Um, and uh, we founded Sacred Design Lab um, out of the research that we were doing at Harvard Divinity School, really interested in uh, the changing nature of spirituality and religion in America. So more and more people here are becoming less and less religious, but what we have seen over and over again is not necessarily that, uh, that people are uh, not interested in questions of meaning and connection and experiences of transcendence. It's where they're going to experience those things that that's changing. So really, it's not, not necessarily that religion is in decline, but it's changing. Uh, and people are showing up in their fitness groups, in arts groups, justice groups, you know, using their astrology apps, uh, going on hikes to connect with nature, all, all the ways in which kind of spirituality is transforming, um, but still very much alive and well. And how does, um, how does ritual, has ritual, you say the power of ritual, right? Um, uh, I think about ritual as a tool, but how do you think about ritual? It's really important to define terms because I think we use that word ritual sometimes in an overlapping way with like habits and routines. Um, and so for me, it, it's helpful to distinguish those. Um, routines and habits are, are behaviors that help us fulfill a functional purpose. And ritual, usually when scholars think about it, are... Uh, uh, a set of actions that also have a symbolic meaning. Um, so they, they, they reference meaning or they, uh, they serve a larger purpose than just the functionality. So when we think about rituals, um, they're a really powerful, I like the word that you use, tool, um, to help us connect with the things that matter most. Um, so it might be we want to reconnect with an experience of gratitude or hope, for example. Uh, we might want to remember a loved one uh, or to honor ancestors. Um, we might, uh, we might want to transition from one way of being into another, right, from the work day into rest. Um, so there's, there's a rich catalog of, 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 as we call them, kind of ancient spiritual practices or spiritual technologies that can help us orient our lives uh, towards the things that matter most. Um, so they're a really powerful set of practices um, that help us become the kind of person we want to be in the world. Um, and is there a, a, a a theme between those practices? So the way I've structured the book and, and the practices I'm really interested in are practices that help us remember our inherent connection. Um, and so I, I especially focus on connecting with ourselves, connecting with one another, connecting with the natural world, and then connecting with a, an experience of transcendence. Um, and one of the things that's really important to me is to not say that these practices are there to, to kind of make a connection but that they are helping us to remember that the connection already exists, right? Um, so it's about shifting our frame from a, an individual experience walking around the world where we kind of think about ourselves, if you're anything like me, uh, most of the time, and towards uh, uh, an outlook onto the world that sees the inherent connectivity of all things. So th these practices are ways that um, are really reminders, uh, you know, whether it's lighting a candle, whether it's singing a song, whether it's uh, a blessing a meal, um, that there are all ways that, that help shift our attention to that inherent uh, connection. And as experienced designers, right, there's a big, there has been a big movement, I think, or an awakening. Um, mm -hmm. And it almost became like a bit cliche over the past five years, I would say, of like, um, of experienced designers being pushed to design for rituals. Yeah. Um, would love for you to comment on that. Um, things to things that are interesting about them, things to be wary of. Mm. Yeah, it, this is a very live conversation. I, I co-hosted a gathering of experienced designers and liturgists in October last year, where we brought together people who design rituals in a church context um, with secular experienced designers to, to kind of learn from one another. Um, and it's, it's interesting, both had such useful uh, banks of, of, of ideas and experiences to draw on and collaborate. I mean, I think 
rituals for the sake of rituals misses the point, right? They're always supposed to orient us towards meaning. Um, and so, uh, and, and not every moment has to be ritualized. <laughs> that, that kind of life demands a sort of commitment to, uh, to practice that you really can only do in a monastic context, I think. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess I would say that to, 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 to kind of keep the integrity of the ritual, it's important to be clear about like what's the, the evocation or what, what's the longing that we're tapping into um, and how is it helping people move across that bridge, right? From, from a perspective of isolation and individualism towards one where we see the inherent connection of all things. In this time of social isolation, right, um, there is this um, moment where folks have time to really self-reflect. Um, yeah. Um, but then there's also this uh, moment of feeling of this isolation, right, of being disconnected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how can there, so I guess I have more one question rather than a follow-up, but um, how can, how can ritual really help, um, help to actually create more connectivity um, during quarantine? Yeah. Well, the first thing I think to say is that you're absolutely right that these last few months you know, since the shutdowns, I think have been a time of reckoning. They've, they've interrupted uh, the everyday. Um, and for a lot of people, I think this has been a moment of thinking about how do I really want to live? You know, what's important to me? Who do I want to spend time with? Um, and I, I mean, I know for, for, from polling data in the United Kingdom, 9% of people said they wanted things to go back to exactly how it was, which is a strikingly low number. Um, and I think that there's just a real uh, expression of like, things were not great. Um, you know, whether you were looking at mental health uh, um, rates, you know, suicide, economic inequality, racial uh, disparities. I mean, so, so many ways in which our culture just was not, was not a happy place to be. So that being said, um, absolutely, it's been a real time of, of, of uh, moving towards meaning. 46% of Gen Zs have tried a new spiritual practice since the beginning of quarantine. Um, so it's a really, I think it's a right moment for ritual making. Um, so now to the, the meat of your question, which is, okay, so how do you use them to, to, to make connections? The first to say is that... Um, we can experience connection even if we're not together. We often think about connection being like being physically together. So much of, of ritual is about conjuring and um, uh, uh, connecting with a, an inherent longing or a sense of uh, evocation. So one of the ways in which you, you will see rituals that help uh, connect with ancestry, for example, or lineage, um, is the veneration of elders or the veneration of ancestors. So one way to think about connection is not kind of horizontally to your peers, but to, to you know, future progeny and, and, and ancestors of, of, um, of history. So you can think about altar making as one really powerful way to do that, for example. Um, or in a really simple way, if you're cooking a recipe, uh, that you learned from perhaps, you know, a grandmother who you loved or uh, a loved one who has passed. It's a, it's a way of keeping that connection and, and um, that sense of uh, threading, a, threading a thread across time. Uh, the other way to think about it is um, if you are at a distance from someone um, and you want to, to experience a connection, to, to practice the same thing, even at a distance, at the same time. This is one of the things that we've seen, both in religious cultures, if you think about um, saying the same prayer, for example, in distributed congregations, you still have a sense of being part of an imagined larger community. We saw the same thing in CrossFit boxes, where you have a workout of the day, which is literally a kind of prescribed set of of physical movements, whether it's like 10 burpees plus running for a mile plus, you know, 10 push-ups, whatever it is, to know that other people are doing exactly the same movement, again, helps you feel connected to this imagined larger, larger whole. Um, and so if you are, let's say, uh, uh, you know, making a craft project or you're doing a puzzle or you're, or you're cooking a certain dish, doing it at the same time as someone else that's far away and not even necessarily having a screen, but maybe keeping a phone line open not to have a conversation per se, but just to hear one another's presence is another way that you can evoke it. Perhaps the final thing I'll say is that one of the challenges uh, of this moment is to recreate the kind of community structures that we had before. And I think it's an invitation to think about what new kind of structures for relationship could we create. So this is a moment perhaps to go deeper with a smaller number of people in your life who you can see, perhaps you're already living with them, perhaps they're neighbors or you formed a pod. Um, 
So I think it's, it, it's an invitation not to just try and replicate what we did before and put it online, but to find new ways to build relationships of meaning and depth. Um, it's interesting because like, uh, it's, it's hard to separate ritual from, uh, like from the group, right? It's always, there's always two participants, right? And there's mm. this, I think there's this interesting tension that I just, um, noticed now between the ind an individual versus a collective, um, do rituals evolve and like when individuals or charismatic like leaders of you know sort of communities that are adopting a ritual transform them is is that um you know do rituals evolve or are they is the point of a ritual to be something that stays the same and and you know can be classically utilized over time that's a, that's a great question i mean i would say there are many rituals that, that are performed by individuals. Um, so if you think about um, whether it's studying a sacred text, for example, or laying tarot cards or, um, uh, you know, lighting incense. That, 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 so there are many practices that, that people have on their own. And I'm always really interested, uh, and that's what the book really focuses on, is to, is to help people identify the, the rituals that are perhaps latent in their own life. Um, so whether it's a walk around the block at the end of the day or, um, you know, rewatching a favorite movie when you're feeling really down, like that those are moments of ritual making uh, or potential ritual making. Um, and then, you know, to, to answer the second question about whether ritual changes, this is one of the biggest challenges for religious institutions. Um, Thomas Merton, who's a wonderful Trappist monk, uh, theologian of the 20th century, um, who I quote in the book is really insistent on making a distinction between tradition and convention. And usually when we hear that word tradition, we're like, oh, it's the way things always have been done. And he says, no, that's convention, right? That's keeping the same form of the ritual, whatever the context. And he says, no, tradition is something that is always alive. And it's sort of the beating heart at the center and the and the, the convention is the outer layer. And if we're not careful, that outer layer can kind of stagnate and just people kind of obsess about the outer layer and what it looked like and what's the songs that we sang and where did the chairs go and what flowers do we order? You know, that very kind of, this is the way things are done. And, and he says that tradition is the living heart at the center of it. Um, and so one of the ways I've heard that expressed in a religious context uh, is, is a, by my friend Carol Zinn, who is a nun in uh, uh, her later stages of life. And she says, I'm gonna use her Christian language here, she says that a, a particular expression, right, the particular set of rituals is always a radical response to the gospel in a specific historical and cultural context. So we can translate that to say any ritual that we create should always be a response to the eternal longings, right, the, the move towards connection, the move towards justice, the move towards beauty. Uh, uh, but, the, but the particular way in which that's going to be created is always historically and culturally contextual. So to bring that to a conclusion, the takeaway is that if ritual is not changing, it's very likely uh, that it's going to lose its power, right? There needs to be always something that's alive and responsive to the moment that we're in. And I think for, for religious institutions, that's particularly scary and painful um, because there's a sense of, of letting go of something that's been important to the people in that community. Any change is lost. Um, and so as rituals too change, uh, that can really be experienced as loss. Um, so my perspective is that yes, rituals should change and adapt because it's the way that they can communicate the things of ultimate value to the people experiencing the ritual. Interesting. Um, and then how do we, how can we design for inclusion um, and, and maintain tradition, you know, when mm -hmm. between, between sort of the celebration of ancestors and ancient wisdom and also championing radicals and technology and innovation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm gay, so like, I'm, I'm, I'm right. <laughs> I'm right in there of being like, listen, it can't just stay the same as, as all ancient wisdom, because uh, it's plenty problematic. So um, yes, the, the, the first answer is yes. Uh, and this is why, you know, co-creation is so important. Uh, uh, building um, with the most marginalized in mind and, and, you know, at the design table is so important. 
Um, but also to look at how ritual life is happening in the margins. One of the great fallacies, especially in religion, is that we think there is one Judaism or there's one Islam. And actually there are many Islams, there are many Judaisms, many Christianities. Um, and and this, this sense of uniformity is really a, a political construct as much as anything else. And so we can find incredible expressions of ritual in the very places that perhaps have been pushed out. Um, so I think about, you know, um, the way in which fandoms have created really powerful uh, uh, community rituals. Uh, I think about the way in which um, certainly queer communities have created rituals, uh, which are beautiful uh, expressions of famili familial uh, connection, you know, when they, when they were ousted from their own uh, biological families. So all of that is to say, we are ritual making creatures. Uh, and so there are always interesting things to learn and, and be inspired by, uh, uh, by ritual makers uh, at the margins. Um, so I, I guess that the invitation is to is to co create. Awesome. And then sacred design is a now a service, right? Can you tell me a little bit more about how that service works and some of the type of projects that you've been recently or currently engaged in? Yeah, so Sacred Design Lab is uh, myself and my two co-founders, Angie Thurston and Sue Phillips. Um, and we really spend our time kind of nerding out about the future of community and spirituality, um, especially in the United States. Um, and our work ranges from kind of writing and speaking about these themes in public, but also doing consulting work with partners and clients. Um, and so some of that work is, um, uh, gosh, for example, we're, we're working with a, a large tech firm to imagine what their future headquarter space might look like, knowing that more and more young people are entering the workforce, um, looking to their job for meaning, connection and purpose in a way that maybe traditionally you wouldn't have expected that to happen or conventionally, I should say, you wouldn't have expected that to happen. Uh, and so what are the new physical spaces that are going to be needed in the workplace? You know, do we need sort of temples of inspiration in the head office? Do we need uh, uh, specific spaces for small groups to make meaning uh, and share authentically? Um, so that's that's one example. Um, we're working with the Wellbeing Trust, which is a, a foundation um, whose mission is to serve the mental, social and spiritual well-being of the country to think about what really is spiritual well-being? How do we know if someone is spiritually well? Um, so to create an assessment um, that could be used uh, to help people uh, both notice for themselves, but also help a community notice, like, okay, we might be really efficient at achieving these particular economic outcomes, but everyone is burning out, or uh, we're, not, we're not treating each other in the way that we would want to in the, the world that we know is possible. Um, so to, to, to find basically a new system of, of measurement, uh, or at least indication, indication uh, to point to, to spiritual well-being. Um, and then we, uh, we worked with the Obama Foundation, for example, to create a reflection process for young activists who um, you know, are going through a, a learning process to learn about community organizing. But we know that without reflection and meaning making, um, a, a lot of activists will struggle to maintain that commitment prominently in years to come. So uh, for us, these, these are tools, these are, these are spiritual technologies that can help us uh, uh, serve, uh, that can serve us in, in all sorts of part of our lives. And we get to explore what that looks like with, with all sorts of different partners and very different sectors. So it's never boring, um, but we kind of call it, a, a, instead of a, a human-centered design approach, we think about it as a soul-centered design approach. That's really nice. I mean, I will say that, um... It dawned on me, so I, I have a family's very relig Christian religious on both sides, but Korean and West Virginian. And wow. the West Virginian family is always complaining that there's no more prayer in schools in America. And I was like, well, but there still are meditations, you know, and what if there was actually a different type of exercise or ritual or prayer? Um, every day would that work? But it's, it's there's so much about, you know, um, you are asking seems, the right questions. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so, so much happening where there's a, I think, I think what um, I used to study cults, actually. And like, mm -hmm. I think that the um, cults have used ritual as a tool to normalize um, sometimes gross behaviors. And I think this work that you're doing with the well being trust is pretty interesting. Um, and, and I'm sure you're very 
um, seem like a nice guy and like very like, you know, you know, <laughs> care, careful, right? But how do you, Absolutely. you know that, and as you know that, you know, ritual is very powerful. How can experienced designers um, also just sort of double check themselves and make sure that they are doing the right things and that they are using um, ritual in a responsible way? Absolutely. I just want to double down on what you said. I mean, think of think of those famous videos that we've seen from, you know, the Third Reich, where, where ritual and experience design were used for terrifyingly effective and, and uh, uh, ho yeah, horrific impacts. Um, so ritual is a tool, absolutely. And it can be and it can be uh, weaponized in, in really horrific ways. One of the things that, you know, as, as someone who's been through divinity school, one of the things you learn is that if you are creating experiences that reach towards kind of ultimate experience. If we're going to that soul depth um, for participants in, in rituals that we're creating, that it demands all sorts of things of you as a leader that you have to be prepared to manage. Now that includes the projections that a congregation or a group of people who you lead uh, are going to put onto you, both in the sense of like, they might not like you and make you responsible for everything that's wrong. But I think even more dangerously, they might think of you as some sort of guru or that you have all the answers. And if you're not careful, that goes right to your head uh, and you start to make excuses for uh, behavior that's incredibly damaging. And so think about all of the horrific sexual abuse, for example, that's happened in religious spaces. Um, so first of all, you know, the, the issue of boundaries is really important. The issues of support and accountability so that you have a place, if you're the leader of a ritual experience, that you have colleagues or, 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 or mentors or even people with authority over you that you can go to and make sense of what has happened or, or figure out why that felt icky or how do we change that for next time and make sure that you do right by the people you're leading. Um, but also to make sure that you're not trying to lead people beyond where you yourself have been. Um, and so this is this is something that I think for ritual makers can sometimes be challenging or experienced designers is we don't even know what the things that we create can do to the people who experience them. Uh, and I have made this mistake <laughs> very often uh, in the sense that, you know, you think you want to bring people together for a beautiful retreat experience and you're going to do this and that or whatever. And people leave deciding that they're going to get divorced, they're going to quit their job, uh, you know, all sorts of things that had enormous impact. And you wanna really be careful that you're doing those things responsibly. Um, so we, we often talk about, you know, if you're gonna draw on the incredible potential that lives at that soul level, you also have to be really resourced and really intentional about the responsibilities that that comes with. Um, because if you don't take them into account, you will do harm. Yeah, and then from the um, participants, like you know, um, experience, like how can how can we be um, also um, careful, but then open, right? Yes. To, uh, yeah. Because you don't want to close off the channel into meaning or soul, right? Totally. Totally. I mean, one of the ways you can think about it is to make space for integration. So not to rush like with great speed from one thing into the next. Um, and to know that things just move like a little slower <laughs> at that at that level of depth and it needs time it needs time to integrate um so that's one um i think one of the things you know maybe a, a good example of what's the di distinction between a religious community and a cult is for a cult if you're going in there's no way out except complete breaking right and, and in a religious community or in a healthy spiritual experience or a spiritual community there can be a gentle way in and also a gentle stepping back and maybe later go back in or step back, right? That there is a much more um, a safe and um, soft landing, both stepping in and stepping out. Um, so that's something to look for. Um, and I mean, one of, the, one of the principles for our work at Sacred Design Lab is that the, the means are the ends. And so if you're being told, oh, you have to do this really difficult, horrific, painful, whatever thing, because on the other side it's worth it i'm always very 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 suspicious of it because for us you know the way in which the journey is shaped is the destination that you're going to go to um, and so if we have values we have to be practicing them <clears throat> excuse me if we want to see them be manifested in the world 
Beautiful. I'm such a fan. I, I, I was like, like, I look at a lot of stuff like around like ritual stuff. And most of the time I'm like, Oh God, you know, like someone just trying to make a buck and then, uh, you know, and so I was, I was very curious, like everything. And, um, you know, for, I, I hope that everyone like reads every single word on your website, which I did. And I was like, everything's just so, um, so thoughtful. And also what it was really remarkable for me was that there was a space I, it feels like in between uh, your sentences for more learning, more, mm. you know, and, and well, I hope so, because I still need to learn more. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, but that comes that that comes across as very clear, which makes it authentic. And um, thank you so much for taking the time with me today and sharing your perspective. So it was really, um, really delightful. Thank you. thank you so much. Well, I, I'll say that, you know, those words on the website, it, it, at best, they are translations of things that we have learned. So there's nothing new under the sun. We we're just trying to, you know, carry carry these traditions into uh, into 2020. I guess. <laughs> That's right. No, it's wonderful. Keep the good work. We hope to be working with you um, soon and and connecting you with some folks who could really use your help. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks so much, Gaston. <laughs> Cheers. Bye.